Uh, and again, I think we finished chapter two on our last exam. I'm not mistaken. Let me just double check that. Yeah, it looks like we got chapter two on that last exam. Uh, so it'll be chapter three, chapter four. Chapter four is the big one. You'll see combination circuits, multi-loop circuits, household circuits. You need probably free response for that. Uh, basic Ohm's Law stuff, power. And then you'll also see a little bit of chapter five. Uh, chapter five will probably just have cross products, which we've done before, but we'll see them in a slightly different context. Well, let's begin on chapter five now. Y'all try sticking anything in your outlets? Any paper clips or whatever? You told everyone at work. Yeah. yeah, we'll see how many of them actually fare from that. Huh? <laughs> Do we already work, Emma? All oh, right. All right. So just some basic stuff about magnetism. You probably know this from grade school. I mean, you studied magnets a little bit in grade school or high school. Uh, magnets have poles. And these are called north or south poles, right? So if we have a bar magnet, we have a north pole on one end and a south pole on another end. Like poles repel, a lot like charges. Opposite poles attract. All right, so you've probably done this before where you put two magnets together, you have a north and a south pole, and then you have a south and a north pole and you feel an, a repulsive force between them. You ever try to force two magnets together? A really strong magnet, they'll just sort of go off to the side of one another. And then the third is that monopoles do not exist. And this gets to the idea of what actually causes a magnet and that the magnetic fields are created by moving charges. So that means that monopoles do, uh, don't exist. Let me explain. A well, long time, people thought that monopoles did exist. That is, they thought that if you take a magnet, north and south, and you split it in two, now they knew that if you split it in two that you would get two magnets. One would have north and south, and then the other would have north and south like that. That if you split it in two, if you just broke it, that it would give you two separate magnets, each with two poles. But for a long time, people thought that if you kept doing this over and over and over again that eventually you get to a point where you'd have a north pole and you'd have a south pole and these are called monopoles that it only has a north pole or it only has a south pole um, but they didn't know what caused magnetic fields and now that we know what causes magnetic fields we know that this cannot exist because magnetic fields are created by moving charges And electrons, which are always moving, right? They're always buzzing about the, the nucleus of an atom. They actually create magnetic fields. And uh, I'm going to start calling them now just so I don't have to write out magnetic B fields. But B just means, you know, the magnetic. Or we'll use that as our variable for magnetic field. Uh, this is a lot like our electric field, by the way. You remember the electric field was a field of forces? The magnetic field also is a field of forces. We use it to describe the force that a particle feels when it's in that magnetic field, but we'll calculate it in a slightly different way. So you can't have these monopoles because you can't split your electron up into separate pieces, that you'll always have that sort of fundamental unit of a negative charge that's buzzing about. By the way, if you have a proton buzzing about too, that creates a magnetic field. But as you know, protons just don't move around in the same way as electrons do. So we'll just talk about electrons moving. Uh, we need to define what is a magnetic domain. A magnetic domain is, a, is just a region within a material where, the where you have uniform magnetization. That is that you have groups of electrons are oriented such that their magnetic fields all line up. in the same, are their magnetic fields are all in the same direction. Did you know that you're magnetic? Did you know that? Or at least you have charges, right? You have electrons in your body. 
and they're all moving around, right? You have electrons that are moving around your body, and each of those electrons is generating its own little magnetic field. And so in a sense, you have a lot of magnetic fields inside your body. And so you know, if your magnetic fields were all lined up, then y'all would all be either attracted to one another or you'd all be repelled for one another. Sounds like that's sort of like a, a weird pickup line or something, right? Hey, I got a magnetic field in front of me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you're not actually attracted or repelled from one another because your magnetic domains, that is these regions of magnetization within your body from the electrons that may or may not be lined up, they're not lined up in fact. And so you sort of look like this. Here's your head, your arms, and your legs. That your magnetic domains in your body are all oriented randomly. So that gives you a net magnetic field equal to zero. So this guy, he has zero magnetic field because those vectors, they all cancel one another out. Right. We've added up vectors. You did this in the lab with the, the coil. Remember the coil that you used and you put the compass in it and you were adding up two magnetic field vectors. You can do that. You added up the field vector that you generated with that coil of wire and then you added up, you added that to the Earth's magnetic field, and then you measured the new magnetic field. That was how you measured the deflection. You measured the angle of the new magnetic field. And so you can add up these magnetic fields just like vectors, just like we did with forces, just like we did with electric fields. You can just add them up like vectors, and these will all add up to give you a net magnetic field of zero. But in a permanent magnet, the electrons, they all line up to create a net field which is just the sum of the magnetic domain. So in this case, my magnetic field is bigger than zero because those electrons, they're all spinning in the same direction. They're all zooming about in the same direction. And that causes this, this permanent magnet to have a net magnetic field. So magnetic fields are, are described by magnetic domains and permit, permanent magnets have the magnetic domains all in the same direction. Okay, um, permanent magnets are created when molten metals solidify in the Earth's magnetic field. This is how they make uh, magnets in the lab as well. Except they don't use the Earth's magnetic field, they use another magnetic field. But in short, this is how they're made. You have a Volcano, molten metals come out of the volcano, and they, they go out and they sort of make this river of lava that goes off until it cools. So around these volcanoes, like uh, like say on the big island of Hawaii, you have this volcano and it's constantly spitting out lava, and there's just like this slow river of lava that heads out to the ocean. And eventually it cools and there's these huge lava fields that you can walk on and actually walk out to see this river of hot molten lava. But these things when you have these uh, lava flows within the Earth's magnetic field, so I have the Earth's magnetic field here, what that causes is for the magnetic domains of these lava flows, this molten metal, to line up within the Earth's magnetic field. And then when the lava cools, it sort of locks those electrons into place. When it's really hot, the, the magnetic domains of the electrons can move around and they orient themselves with the magnetic field of the Earth in blue, generating their own magnetic field in purple here. And then when it cools, when the lava cools, the magnetic domains are locked in place. And this is very similar for making magnets in the lab. You take a bar of molten metal, iron or whatever, some material that's what we'll call ferromagnetic. I'll define that in just a minute, but it means that it's able to be magnetized. And I put it within a magnetic field, and then I cool the metal, allow it to solidify, and it locks those magnetic domains into place. That's how you create magnets. That's how you make these really super strong magnets. 
Uh, you can also make electromagnets. You might have made an electromagnet in grade school. Anybody ever do that? You did it, Jesse? Just you. People don't do this as much anymore. But you take a nail and you get some wire. It's called magnet wire. It's just plain wire, basically. And you wrap it around the magnet and you run a current through the... I mean, you wrap it around the nail and then you run a current through the, through the wire and it creates a magnet. Uh, we'll talk about how currents generate electromagnetic magnetic fields, but you know currents consist of what? Moving what? We're moving electrons. And magnetic fields at their very basic level are generated by moving charges. So whenever I have these moving electrons, it generates a current. So electromagnets use moving charges in a wire. you know, a.k.a. current, uh, that is a moving charge in a wire, to create a magnetic field which aligns the magnetic domains of the material. This material must be ferromagnetic. And some, what this means, ferromagnetic, means that it's able to be magnetized. It's not necessarily a magnet, but it just means that it's able to be magnetized. So some materials that are ferromagnetic actually, there aren't a whole lot of materials that are ferromagnetic, but the primary one is what? Do you know what ferro means or ferrous means? It's iron, right? What's the chemical uh, symbol for iron? Fe, right, like ferrous. So um, iron is a ferromagnetic material. Other metals are not necessarily ferromagnetic, like copper is not ferromagnetic. You ever try to attract copper with a magnet? It doesn't do anything. Aluminum, not ferromagnetic. Uh, so a lot of metals aren't ferromagnetic, but iron is. It doesn't mean that it's a magnet. It just means that it's able to be magnetized. So you can think of this. Uh, all magnets are ferromagnetic. But not all ferromagnetic materials are magnets. All it means is that their magnetic domains are able to be aligned. That when given the proper conditions, you can align the magnetic field or the uh, magnetic domains of that material. And so here we have a ferromagnetic material inside a wire with no current. But when we turn on the current, the, the wire actually generates a magnetic field. And then that causes the magnetic domains of the material to line up. So the current causes current generates a magnetic field and this causes the magnetic fields the magnetic domains to line up all right let's take a uh, let's do a quick test here Hillary, what's going on this weekend? best describes why some materials are permanent magnets. All right, let's stop at uh, one minute. One minute. Okay, very good. So uh, you have to think about the magnetic domains. They have to all be aligned in the same direction. 
Hey, do you know uh, how many tickles it takes to make an octopus laugh? Ten tickles. <laughs> All right, so which of these best explains why a permanent magnet is magnetized? All right, let's stop at 30. 30. Okay, let's see. Uh, not because it has a current, although, you know, if you have a current through something, that does create a magnetic field. But in a permanent magnet, there is no current. There is no flow of charge. Uh, and it is because electrons produce their own magnetic field, but that's true for us, too, that we have electrons and we have all these little magnetic fields within our body, but they're all randomly oriented, so they cancel out. So the, the real reason is B that the magnetic domains of the atoms are aligned. All right, let's look at magnetic fields. This is going to be a lot like what we saw with electric fields. Um, we'll use magnetic field lines to represent the strength and direction of the magnetic field. And we have a couple of rules. They begin at the north and end at the south pole. So like drawn here, they come out of the north pole and then they go into the south pole. And then the second one is that the density of the field lines is proportional to the magnetic field. proportional to the magnetic field. All right, so I have a point here, and I have a point out here. Right? We'll call this A, and we'll call this B. Where is the magnetic field greater, the magnitude of the magnetic field, at A or B? A, All right, just like we saw with electric fields. So A has a stronger magnetic field. than B. And we can tell that just because the lines are closer together. So that's, that's not just electric fields and that's not just gravitational fields, but that's, those are general rules, at least about the density of the lines, that holds for all lines of force or all fields of forces. Uh, you need to know a little bit about the Earth's magnetic field. A uh, compass needle, you know, is a magnet. It has a north and a south pole. And the north pole of the um, of the needle points north. And I'm going to talk about geographic north and magnetic north. So when I say this, I mean it actually points in the geographic north direction, like up towards, you know, Chat Bay, right? Uh, so the needle points up towards the north, and then the south pole of the needle points south, like down near Homa. So this is the geographic south and the geographic north. And so if we're to imagine the, uh, the Earth as a giant bar magnet, then we could imagine that the magnet would be that the south pole of the magnet would be at the uh, geographic north pole. So imagine you know, that we have this big magnet that's the Earth, and I have a south pole here and a north pole here. But this points up towards the northern geographic pole, and this points down towards the southern geographic pole. So where I have my northern geographic pole is actually the southern magnetic pole, and where I have the southern geographic pole, you know, like where the penguins are in Antarctica and all that, that's the northern magnetic pole. And the reason is if we have a compass, 
you know, a compass is just a magnet. So imagine this, I have another magnet. This is my compass. How do y'all say compass? I'm not saying it wrong, am I? Compass? My wife says compass. She's from the Missouri. They don't know how to talk there. <laughs> oh, somebody here is from Missouri, right? Who is that? No, it's not in the class. Anyway, if you have a compass, um, you know, you have the North Pole that points towards the North and the South Pole that points towards the South. It aligns up with the magnetic field. Remember, your North Pole is going to attract to your Southern Magnetic Pole, and your South Pole will attract to your Northern Magnetic Pole. But that's why we call the Northern Geographic Pole the North. It's because the North Pole, the magnet points to the North. And the South Pole, the magnet points to the South. But the magnetic poles are switched. Magnetic poles of the Earth change every 100,000 years or so. To, by the way, I think that we're that they're predicting is this yeah yeah y'all know this right geomatics are they predicting a change soon? Oh, the the magnetic field of the Earth changes. Right. All right. Uh, you can also have iron ore deposits that can be magnetic, and that can affect a compass. And as y'all found in the lab too, that the magnetic field that you measure say in the lab can be affected not just by the earth's magnetic field but also by what iron ore deposits are by electrical wires in the in the walls and in the devices that you use because those all generate since they have moving charges they all generate magnetic fields so you have a little video um so anyway iron ore deposits and other things can affect the magnetic field of the earth Let's try this quicker question. You might have a couple, like a free response question too, or you might just have a couple, one or two multiple choice questions about this. But try this question. Which pole of a magnet points towards the magnetic north pole? Let's stop in about five seconds. We'll stop at 40. Okay, good. A is right. The magnetic north pole, uh, yeah, the magnetic north pole is at the south pole, and so the south pole of a magnet points towards the south. So A is the right answer. Hey, what does a clock do when it's hungry? It goes back for seconds. Okay, uh, the magnetosphere of the Earth is also very important to, you know, the protection of our Earth, mainly because the sun is always putting out these high energy particles. And sometimes we get bursts of high energy particles from the sun as they come towards the Earth. But those high energy particles uh, encounter the Earth's magnetosphere meaning just like the, the magnetic field that surrounds the Earth, that's due to the Earth's, uh, the magnetic field of the Earth. And the, that magnetic field will deflect those charged particles and actually cause them to go out away from the Earth or around the Earth as they move out into space. I have a couple of videos about this, one of which it sort of shows a simulation of the Aurora Borealis. You ever heard of the Aurora? Have I ever seen the Aurora? Anybody? If you go up pretty far north, like to Alaska or to northern England, uh, northern Europe, to see the aurora borealis, because it really only happens up near the poles. The aurora borealis is caused when these charged particles come in, and they get sucked up into the magnetic fields, and they'll go into the northern parts of the planet. It only occurs in the north, because that's where the magnetic fields originate, either in the north or in the south. And it doesn't usually come down far as far as definitely not as far south as Louisiana. Sometimes you'll see them up in northern the United States, but not this far south. Uh, yeah, Jesse. So why does it shift so Okay, so that's the other part of the video is that you get this. We're not going to talk about this too much, but you can have these high energy charged particles, and they'll actually reshape the magnetic field. That there are forces that are involved where the mag these charged particles, they're so high energy, they'll sort of take the magnetic field and they'll strip it around 
and sort of bend it in the wind, kind of like you know a reed blowing in the wind, in a similar way as that. Okay. Uh, this video is not going to talk about, it, but it shows like a simulation of it. And then the other thing is, uh, is just sort of an interesting piece about the solar wind and how it affects our communication systems. But let's watch those. Uh, the first is just a simulation. It's just a few seconds. All right, let's look at the cross product, and this will probably be the last thing for today. We've seen the cross product. Remember, we did it last semester with the torques, but let's just review it. It's going to be uh, a pretty major thing for this chapter that you'll need to do. The cross product, or sometimes called the vector product, is the product of two vectors. And the result of the cross product is orthogonal to both of the vectors. Orthogonal just means perpendicular and 90 degrees to one another. So, for example, the x, y, z coordinate system, this is x, this is y, this is z, those coordinates are orthogonal to one another. z is at 90 degrees to y, z is at 90 degrees to x, and all the axes are at 90 degrees to one another. Um, the magnitude of the cross product is equal to the area of the parallelogram bordered by the two vectors. And so if I'm thinking about the vectors A and B, I have the vector A in this direction and the vector B in this direction. Uh, these two vectors don't have to be orthogonal to one another, but the result of the cross product is going to be orthogonal both to A and to B. And the magnitude of that is going to be equal to the area of this parallelogram. So whatever this parallelogram is will be the magnitude of that product. And that's given by this equation. I don't know if you remember your parallelograms, but it's equal to uh, the base times the height, which is, this is my base, which is the magnitude of the vector b, and then my height is a times sine theta. So that's how we find the magnitude of those cross product is going to be a times b times sine theta. So a cross b will be equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the sine of the angle theta. So if you're just looking for the magnitude and not the direction, then you can just do that. Find the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the sine of the angle between them. It has several applications in physics, like we saw it with uh, you know, torques, and we're going to see it again with magnetic fields, and if you go on, especially your engineering majors, you might see it in other things as well. Um, and we used it with torques, because with torques, we are looking for a force that was perpendicular to our moment arm, and the cross product deals with vectors that are perpendicular to one another. Uh, let's just do a, a sample cross product. We'll take two vectors. A and B, and I'm going to express them in vector notation. So I have AXI plus AYJ, and then BXI plus BYJ. Remember my IJK notation, I is X, J is Y, uh, Z is K. I, X, J, Y, K is Z. And I put these hats on them because that indicates that they're unit vectors, right? They have a magnitude equal to 1. Sometimes you might see x, y, and z with little hats, and that has the same meanings, that it's a unit vector in the x, the y, or the z direction. But we use i, j, and k typically. And so the cross product is going to be axi plus ayj crossed with bxi plus byj. And then I can do FOIL to expand that. The first, outer, inner, last, right? So first would be this, that's F. So that's going to be AXI, or excuse me, AX, BX, I cross I. That's going to be the result of the first. The outer is going to be AYBY. 
I cross J. The inner is uh, AYBX. J cross I. It's very important that I get the order of these unit vectors correct. So I don't write I cross J, for example, for AYBX. I write J, I write J cross I. And then finally, the last is AYBY. J cross J. All right, so this is the, the full cross product written out in longhand. I just get it by foil. Uh, first, outer, inner, last. And then I have to be very careful that I get I cross J in the correct order here because I'm doing A, Y, B, Y, this times this, so this times this. Is that right? Oh, this should be an A, X. Sorry, yes, thank you. It was an X, I just didn't do the tail on it. All right, see, so I got that. That's an AX right there. Okay, now we want to notice with our cross product, in fact, you probably already see this, is that we said that A cross B, the magnitude of this, is equal to AB sine theta. But when theta equals 90 degrees, sine of theta equals 1. But when theta equals 0 degrees, sine of theta equals equals zero. So you can probably tell that some of these terms are going to go away. Which terms are going to go away? The red, blue, green, or purple? The red and the purple are going to go away because the angle between I and I is zero degrees. Likewise, the angle between I and negative I, the sine of that angle is also zero degrees. Sine of 180 is also zero. So this term will go away and this term will go away. So our cross product is going to simplify just to those two terms. All right. Now we'll use something called the right-hand rule. We saw this last semester. We're going to use it a lot this semester. Uh, I think we just sort of, I think many of you probably just memorized what I cross J, J cross I, and all that business was. But this year you want to actually learn to use the right-hand rule because we'll use it a lot in this chapter. Um, to use the right-hand rule, like the index finger of your right hand Always your right hand. If you go on the internet and look for this, if you need extra practice, be careful because sometimes people will teach the left hand rule and sometimes they'll teach the right hand rule, but they'll teach it a little bit differently. So just be careful as you go about it. If you need extra practice, just let me know. I can give you that. Uh, so the index finger of your right hand goes in the direction of the first vector. And the middle finger of your right hand goes in the direction of the second vector. And then the thumb of your right hand gives the direction of the cross product. So for example, if I'm looking at I cross I, I cross J, J cross I, this is my I coordinate, this is my J coordinate, and then this is my K coordinate. That's my X, Y, and Z. We already said that I cross I and J cross J, those are both equal to zero. But if I want to do I cross J, I let my index finger go in the I direction, my middle finger go in the J direction, and then my thumb gives the cross product, which is in which direction? Which is in the K direction. So I cross J is equal to K. And then J cross I, I let my index finger go in the direction of J. I don't know how to twist my hand, but I want my middle finger to go in the direction of I. So it has to be like this. So now my thumb is pointing into the page. So get J cross I is equal to negative K. And that brings about one of the rules of cross products. If you're in Calc 3, you'll get to this, or you will get it in Calc 3. But that uh, cross products, this is true, that A cross B is equal to the negative of B cross A. Also notice that they're orthogonal, that this that all three of these vectors are orthogonal to one another. Or at least K is orthogonal to I and J. So then the cross product here is going to be um, 
AXBY minus AYBX in the K direction. All right, remember AYBX, this had that term J cross I attached to it, so that's why it's a negative. It becomes a negative K. Remember our symbols to denote the minus Z direction, that's the minus K direction. We use this symbol. It's like an arrow that's going away from you, like the fletching of an arrow. Sometimes we'll just have an X without the circle around it, or sometimes we'll have multiple X's to show a region of a magnetic field. We'll use this to represent the magnetic field, the magnetic field in that region, like when we deal with the mass spectrometer and stuff. For the positive Z direction, that's in the plus K direction, uh, we'll use a dot with a circle around it, or sometimes we'll just use a single dot, or sometimes we'll use multiple dots to represent a region where that vector, usually a magnetic field, is at work. All right. Those are pretty standard, those symbols for representing the plus and minus Z direction. Okay, y'all with me? This should be a review for many of you, though. Uh, it's been a while since we've done cross products. Y'all had Calc 3 yet? No, but you chemists have to take it, right? Yeah, you all take the DE. You're pretty far in there, right? I'm fine. Okay. I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for magnetic forces, just a couple minutes. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up soon. But magnetic forces are QV cross B. I want to know the, the magnetic force that acts on a charged particle as it moves through a magnetic field is the cross product of V and B times the charge, and then the magnitude of that force is given by QVB sine of theta. That's just from our properties of cross products. And sometimes uh, we'll have vectors that are not orthogonal to one another, so this angle theta represents the angle between the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. It'll be whatever angle is given. It's not, not going to be like 90 minus or anything like that. I think we'll stop there. Uh, I think we're done. But y'all have a great weekend. Uh, see some of you around maybe this weekend. But I'll definitely see you on Monday. We'll go into this a little bit more, and I'll give you a definite cutoff. But it's definitely going to include magnetic forces. If you want to start looking at how to calculate the magnetic forces through a charged particle in a magnetic field, you can do so.